Morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together again for, for Bible study, and we pray that you will give us your wisdom. We need it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So last time we met, uh, just to give a little review, we were talking in uh, Colossians chapter 3 toward the end of the chapter about bond servants and their responsibilities to their masters and how you should work um, heartily as to the Lord is how, it's, is how it reads in the scripture, how, how we should work heartily as unto the Lord. And of course, none of us are bond servants, but that's, but that's a very good and godly, uh, ad, that's a very good and godly command. I won't even call it advice. Uh, we should, we have a responsibility to be hardy in our work and to work as if we're working to the Lord, and that would be true whether you're involved in church work or uh, any, any kind of work. And, and again in verse 24 where it says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. So again, as we do our secular work, and there is no such thing as secular work because all of it is given to us by God. It, it, in the Old Testament, it says that it's God who gives us the power to get wealth. So if it's God who gives us the power to get wealth, then our work, uh, if you have a job and you're doing some sort of work and you receive remuneration for it, it's really not coming from it's really not coming from your employer. It's really coming from the God who gives you the power to get wealth. He's the one. And I think if we could, I do believe if we could learn to internalize that idea and recognize that as we go about our business in the church and in the marketplace, that we're actually doing so serving God and actually doing so looking to God to give us. The, uh, the increase in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, give us this day our daily bread. So where does our daily bread come from? Okay. If we could really, if we could really internalize all the time that sort of, that, that idea that God is the center of all of this, I believe it would give us a little more sanity as we go about our daily business. I think it'd give us a little more... Uh, um, peace as we go about our daily business because God knows how to protect us. He knows how to preserve us and he knows how to feed us. Um, before we move on to the next phase and the next chapter, I just want to ask you, uh, well, I'll tell you, in, in my opinion, much of modern society in this country has lost sight of that. We think it's all about us, it's all about depending on us, all about advancing ourselves, all about building ourselves up, rather than what used to be called the Puritan work ethic, where we serve God as we work vigorously. Do you think we've lost sight of that? I think we have too. How do we regain that? Any ideas? Yes, Peter. Okay. And how do we keep that in mind? Okay, Peter said, look up. Okay, so I looked up today. How do we keep that in mind? Mm -hmm. Once? There has to be some intention about it, I think. I think one of the reasons that materialism, keeping, keeping in mind, Peter said keeping in mind, I think one of the reasons that we maybe lose sight of these principles is not that we haven't heard them. What else have we heard the rest of the week? Got to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah, we've heard everything else that's not that. So there's got to be some, some intention on our part 
to think differently. And I don't think that happens uh, without some repetition. Yes, Wes. Yes, Wes. That yeah. rhymes. Two poems <laughs> no, it today. Start, it starts with the establishment of good daily habits. There we go. Of, of focusing yourself on the right thing in the morning when you get up and in the middle of the day when your thoughts start to wander and in the evening when you're getting tired and worn down, you know. And I'm not going to sit over here and be like, I'm perfect at it because my daily habits are awful. Mm -hmm. um, but see, you're, you're acknowledging that and recognizing and stating that you know what, what, what the right thing is. That's where it's got to begin. Oh, great about planning solutions. I'm an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Stephen. I think it's. I started to call you Ken, and that's not your name, <laughs> Stephen. Um, but our our thoughts and our feelings sometimes follow our actions. Yeah. And then in this case, right, like I can wish all day long that I was a generous person with my priorities in order and whatever and then mm -hmm. acknowledging that all my things are from God but like that's not trying to make my mind straight first is going to be hard yeah like, but in like I can sit down with a budget and a spreadsheet and be like I'm going to do this and make this conscious choice that I'm going to commit some some amount of money towards Mm -hmm. this or that thing or I'm going to choose not to do this as a result and th in those moments I can actually use like my the rational part of my brain and the the priorities that I actually say I hold mm -hmm. and then maybe the rest of me will follow along behind me. right so you made the conscious choice I'm going to you, you, in a different way it sounded like you said what Wes said new habits different habits intentional did, did I hear you or mishear you yeah I think so I mean <laughs> well, well, so <laughs> wait a minute wait a minute I just said did I hear you or mishear you and you said yeah yeah so yeah. did I did I mishear you uh, I think so I think there's part partly in alignment with what's Wes is saying okay okay right? you're saying again like you're gonna have it so you're gonna make some conscious effort to make something a regular behavior and here I'm saying you're, you're gonna make a conscious effort to Make a financial decision, mm -hmm. and then trust that God will use that to lead the rest of your heart. Okay, I got you, Kathy. You were going to say something. Well, about a hundred years ago, uh, not long after I was married. How old were you? <laughs> uh, when I was selling Bibles for Southwestern. Okay. And they would meet every morning, and one of the things that I could hear until the cows came home and I can still, I can hear it to this day. If you're going to act, be enthusiastic, you've got to act enthusiastic. Act enthusiastic and you'll be enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that, that applies to this. Mm -hmm. Do I want to do all those godly things in the morning? No. Right. If I get up and do them, then they become a habit. Right. And then I don't have to think about whether I want to do it or not. Right. That's right. Now, Ms. Frida. We're reminded to pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. We're reminded to pray without ceasing. So. Be in a prayerful mood. I'm sorry? To always be in a prayerful mood. Mm -hmm. Always be in a prayerful mood. Okay. So oh, we're looking, we're just kind of reviewing the last part of Colossians 3 about. Uh, um, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance as you do it heartily, do whatever you do heartily as unto the Lord. And we were reflecting on how that's not really how our society thinks and how, how we can remind ourselves to think about what God wants us to think about and know what God wants us to know. And I think a lot of what has been said by Wes and Kathy and, and Stephen is kind of in the same neighborhood. There's gotta be intentionality to it. We've got to intend to think about the things that God wants us to think about if we're gonna have a better perspective on things. And there, 
I would just say, and I think it was already said, there's got to be some repetition to it because how do you develop a new habit if it's not, if you don't repeat it, 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 if you don't repeat it. It's real easy to fall into um, less than healthy habits. And as evidence of that, I would point to our shared experience from the year 2000 until just recently when all of us were encouraged to just sit back, stay back, stay away, shut down, and uh, some unhealthy things came in and took, took the place of that uh, idleness um, and harmed a lot of people in this country. You know, you probably know about the explosion in the number of overdoses. You probably know about the explosion in the number of suicides. There was an mm -hmm. epidemic of dysfunction that accompanied this epidemic of isolation. And uh, yes, um, so ha I'm, I'm, I'm saying that say habits. New habits can have new consequences. Yes. Um, the word habit, I think it's held loosely and I, would like to redefine redefine that in my perspective. Give it to us. Desire. Your godly desire. Yeah. What do you want? Mm -hmm. So how do we ramp up that godly desire so that it becomes something? But like anything else you want to achieve, you have to have goals mm -hmm. and you have to put things in place. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it won't happen without that. You may stumble, but you gotta keep it going. Without that going. effort being made, it won't yeah. happen. Yeah. Will God help us in that effort? If, if we, we lean want. on him. Yeah, if we want it. Okay, so again, here's the thing. I'm just gonna reread 23 through 25, and then we're gonna make one final comment, and then we're gonna move on to the next chapter. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. So work heartily, you're working for God, he knows how to take care of you, and he also knows how to take care of those who are doing wrong. So we have every reason from scripture to have hope, to have confidence, to have joy. But if we don't have a desire to, rem to, to have all of that, we won't remind ourselves of that. And if we don't remind ourselves of that, we'll lose sight of that and we'll think we're all by ourselves and we just can't do it. And, and woe is me and hope will depart. We will not feel that hope if we don't remind ourselves of the hope that we have. That's what I believe. All right, now let's move on to the next chapter. And really the last verse of the previous chapter, let's just read it again, says 25, 325, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done and there is no partiality, no partiality. Masters, now he's talking to the boss man. Give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you have a master in heaven. And is, does he show partiality? We already established that in the previous verse. So who is, who are the high and mighty going to answer to? They're gonna to answer to God. Give your bond servants, and what should their response to that be? What should the boss man's response be, knowing that he's going to answer to God? You should, you should be, yeah, be just, be fair, act like God, behave like God. Be, don't mistreat your your employees. Don't mistreat your servants. Yes, Peter. Recognize who is high and mighty. Recognize who is the real high and mighty. That's right, the Almighty. Okay. So it's a simple message, but you know what? Uh, again, are we living in a world where the uh, boss man is always just and fair? Yep. Has anyone been mistreated? Yes. Okay. Will they 
answer for that if right. they don't come to the cross. Well, uh -huh. They will answer to that if they don't come to the cross. So God knows how to set things right. Now, what do we do when we're going through these periods of injustice and, and, and being mistreated? Well, we already, he already spoke to us about that, didn't he? We look to him. Yes. And it's very interesting when you put it into perspective that there are probably slaves and their masters in this congregation. So they're probably all hearing this together. And it's interesting how Jesus has a way of leveling everybody and putting them on the same path. And I think especially what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, verses 17 through 24, really, where he's talking about how whatever state you're called in, just stay there. If you're a slave, you're a slave. If you're circumcised, you're circumcised. If you're a Greek, you're a Greek. And, you know, he says in verse 22 in particular that the slave is a freed man in Christ. Right. And the freed man is a slave in Christ. Right. And they're all on the same level. So if you're a slave, of course you can work heartily as to Jesus because he's freed you. He has so. given you freedom. Right. And if you're a master, you better act correctly because you're now his slave and you're accountable to your master's wishes. And in the end, they both end up in the same place. Right. Is a slave accountable to God? Mm -hmm. Is the master accountable to God? Yeah. Is the employee accountable to God? Is the boss man accountable to God? All of us are accountable to God because he's, God is giving instructions to all of these, all of, all of these people, right? And, and again, even the powerful will answer to God. Yes, Barry. Nebuchadnezzar was a good example, right? Whoo! I love that story. Yeah. Did God take care of Nebuchadnezzar's pride? Gave him the ultimate timeout. That, that actually is one of my favorite Bible stories. And did God show mercy to Nebuchadnezzar? How many kings would lose their kingdom if they were out uh, in the field living like an animal? And yet he was restored. There's no indication that he ever lost really anything other than those seven lost years and his pride. <laughs> um, so, keeping this in mind, verse 25 of the last chapter and verse one of the next chapter, he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done and there's no partiality. And then this admonition to the masters to recognize that they are slaves of Christ. You have a master, it says. Um, anything, anybody, can anybody think of any applications in our, in our current culture, in our current crisis, in our current situation that might help us stay sane? When society has lost its way, when our govern, government, yeah, I'm gonna say it, when our government has lost its way, when the temptation is just to, I don't know, uh, get very angry about, about things. It helps me to know that I serve a God in heaven who is impartial and who also knows how to, what did we just read? Repay those who have done wrong. Vengeance doesn't belong to me. Yes. Very and then says, man. Revelation says when the end comes, Christians are going to suffer. They're going to starve. They're going to be uh, mistreated. But the ones that persevere Boom. and stay true to God will be given the reward of eternal life in heaven. And all the rest, not such good news. Be faithful unto death and you'll receive the crown of life. Does it say be vengeful unto death? No. It says be faithful unto death and you'll receive the crown of life. I would like to be vengeful. You know, vengeful. The thought crosses my mind occasionally, but I got to keep telling myself vengeance belongs to the Lord. Yeah. And he'll do a way better job than 
I could ever imagine if someone is that evil and he's, he's that kind of judgment. You'll take care of him. He's far more capable, has far more resources, and he has complete knowledge of who is guilty and who is innocent. I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy leaving that to God. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not going to tell the truth. We must tell the truth. We must be people of the truth. But, but, were you going to say something else, Barry? I stepped on you. Well, no, that's okay. I was just going to say, you know, as far as Christians go, humility and humbleness should never be mistaken for weakness. Amen. Amen. Matthew. The only way this can really happen is if we have accountability for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because all of this is nestled in the context of chapter 3, which is to set our mind on things above and realize that the important thing in this world is not this world. Right. It is the Christ who rules the world. And that we are to put to death the fleshly things that cause the slaves to rebel and cause the masters to mistreat their slaves. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. It doesn't depend on how someone else treats you. It depends on how we as people and as individuals cut off those bad parts of ourselves and conform to the image of Christ. So no matter how other people treat us, we are still responsible for acting like Christ. And that's not something that other people can make us do. And it's also not something we can blame them for if we choose not to do. Because in the end, we are judged on our own works and the things we have done in our own body, not based off what others have done to us. So if we're really going to cut off the old things and put on the new man, then it is a personal, individual thing we have to do with support from the brethren and God. Amen. I've, I think I've mentioned this old documentary called, Wep called uh, Weapons of the Spirit. It tells a story of the, have I, have I mentioned this? Yeah. Tells a story of um, a Huguenot community in, in France. The Huguenots were French uh, Protestants, and they had, had, they had gone th through a period of suffering during the time of the Reformation because France was a Catholic country, and, and they were not. And they ended up kind of migrating into the mountains, and I think it's in the eastern France. Yeah. And um, it far, far enough from Paris that they had some isolation. And then in World War II, when the Vichy government uh, capitulated almost immediately to the Nazis, uh, trouble, trouble began. And their religious leaders told them that their battle was not going to be won with, with weapons, but that, not with uh, human weapons, but with weapons of the spirit. And so they didn't, uh, they didn't join the resistance officially but they joined the resistance spiritually. They hid 5,000 Jews in their communities. And in some ways, even in plain sight, the Nazis who were supposedly running the thing, they kind of knew what was going on, but they didn't have the uh, cruelty to uh, rat any of this, uh, of this rebellion out. And those 5,000 migrated to Israel after, after World War II. It's a fascinating story. They just did what was right. And in fact, you interview some of the people that were old, they, they interviewed some of the people. This was done by a, a man who was born in that community in 1945 and shortly thereafter uh, escaped with his family to Israel. And he went back to interview some of the people that were the protectors of his family and, and children. And they said, well, it was just the right thing to do. They just did the right thing. Do we believe that it's gonna be enough just to do the right thing? Book of Revelation would say it is, right, Barry? Just to follow Christ, be faithful until death. And um, so, in order to do these things, children to follow their parents, parents to treat their children right, husbands to treat their wives right, wives to treat their husbands right, slaves to treat the masters right, masters to treat the slaves right, all of these relationships, if we're primarily submitted to God, we can have sanity. 
We can have health, we can have success. Church relationships, right? How do we submit to the elders? How do the elders submit to, to God? How do, you know, how do those relationships work out? If we are all submitted to God and to, and to trying to do it his way, if we discover we haven't done it his way, who are we following? See, then we can have sanity. We can have unity. If we, uh, if, if we properly understand this idea of submitting to God and as it says in, uh, in uh, Ephesians, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. If we can learn to do that, man, there's, there's power there. Yes, sister. I, I just wanted to add to that too, I think. When God's people are doing their best in, in this relationship, what you're referring to with relationships, like we should reflect all of the world. We should have different ages in our congregations and, and different races and different levels of means, similar to what is being mentioned here in terms of master versus servant. And what I find is that I do think you can see that when, when God's people are trying to do their best. When you go out into the world, it's not like that. No. You know, when I look at my children's school or like the activities that sometimes like the parents who congregate together are most like one another. Right. And when you do see Christian influences in that, you see that much more acceptance. Again, when we're doing it right because we fail too. But like, I think you can see that in our congregation and in other congregations who are doing that, and, and that's a big part of the reason that I love being here, because I don't think it's like that everywhere else. Well, the whole thing, uh, it, 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 there's, that's always a concern, because in fact, James talked about that, about showing partiality to wealthy people and, and, and all of that. Um, so yeah, it, it can infect a church. We're to be, he's called us out of every tribe and tongue and nation. If he's called us out of every tribe and tongue and nation, then we should be willing to accept every tribe and tongue and nation that wants to follow Christ. And that, well, I, you know what? Amen. Thank you for what you said. All right, let's continue. Verse two of chapter, of chapter four, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open uh, to us a door for the word to speak the ministry, the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So here we have again, just like in the lesson this morning, the apostle Paul asking for help in his primary task of speaking that he should make it manifest as I ought to speak. It's almost like he's asking for boldness again. Now, Paul needed prayers that he would speak and make it plain. Uh, who else needs prayers that we would speak and make it plain? Every one of us. Again, I think we, I think we, We just need to learn our dependence on God and on each other to pray for us. And the more we learn that, I believe the more boldness that we're gonna have and the more doors that are gonna, that are gonna open. Now, let me explain to you what I mean when I say we, we ought to be speaking because some of y'all may think, okay, here's what it's not like. Kim and I went into a, a we were sitting down at, I don't know, the subway in Richmond a couple of years ago. And these guys come in and they're, you, you can just kind of tell when you're meeting some people that are religious in some way. And they were talking kind of loud and they were talking kind of spiritual and they're talking kind of this and that. And I said, and I'm, you know, I like to talk to people. So I said, hey, what are you doing? We're out winning souls. That's really not what I'm talking about. Yes, we're out winning souls. We need to be out winning souls. But you know what? You don't need to be winning souls. That's like you're, you're you know. Give me Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> Just play along with me. Man. I don't even know what I'm gonna do. So, how you doing? Are you, are, are, have you ever thought about your soul? Are you, are you sure you're going to heaven? <laughs> going, that's, that's not what we're talking about. 
Thank you. That's all I need. Great part. That that's not what we're talking about. The gospel is good news to be shared by regular people in regular situations. Give an example that happened yesterday. We we're at Home Depot buying some stuff. And the girl was nice, and I said, well, are you having a good day? I mean, and she went, yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, that didn't sound good. She said, well, no. I said, and I said, well, I don't know if you're religious or not, but my wife and I will pray for you. See, that's normal. It's a little, it's a little weird because you're admitting that you're religious. It's a little weird because you're admitting that you pray, but it's still in the normal realm of things. And she said, thank you. And I handed her my card, which has my phone number on it, said, call me anytime. And she said she would. And she admitted that though she was raised religious, she'd gotten away from going to church and she needed to get back into church. That's, no, you're saying, wow, but actually, Emily, you could have done that. Anybody can have, a, how many conversations have you had over the course of your lifetime? We can do this. We can do this if we are willing to admit that we are believers, if we're polite, if we don't advance on people like I advanced on Matthew, you know, if we're not, if we try not to be scary, and if we listen, any one of us can do that. You may think you can't, but God will help you. Now, so we should pray for these open doors. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> I try every day. Sometimes I forget. I do try every day, Lord, open up a door. Father, open up a door. Help me to see the open door. Help me to walk through the door in an appropriate manner. And what if all hundred or so of us were praying that same prayer? I, 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 I think we'd be surprised at the harvest that might come. If we're just willing to be kind, listen, offer attention, care. All right. Notice Paul didn't say, open up the door to the prison, let me out. No, he did, yeah, yeah, uh, for which I'm in chains. He just acknowledged he was in chains. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He, didn't, he didn't ask for that, did he? Good, good catch, okay? Remember, God said he was going to preach in Rome, okay? And he did so as a prisoner, Yes. I think one of the hardest things to do is, is to keep all of this in mind because we have so many things that are vying for our attention. But one thing I remember about this is that Paul had not been here. He did not know all of these people other than what he had heard. They didn't really know him other than what they had heard, but they'd never met. They didn't have an established type of relationship. Right. And as people, we tend to be very centered on ourselves and our circle. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, if, if there's a shooting in Chicago, it doesn't really affect you. You know, if there's a shooting in Massachusetts, may not really affect you. If there's a shooting in your neighborhood, now mm -hmm. you're worried, yeah. right? Or, you know, if somebody breaks into a car in Canada, you don't care. But if it's your car or your family's car, mm -hmm. now you've got a problem and you've got something on your mind. Right. So when Paul had said, you know, it's in the lesson this morning, pray for all the saints. Yeah. It's not just the people that we hang out with. It's not just the people on our prayer list or our congregation. It's all the congregations. It's all the countries. It's all the Christians. Mm -hmm. And he's asking them to pray for someone they don't really know. And you're like, well, how do I pray for people I don't know? But that, that's what the spirit is for. And that's what we learn the will of God for, that we can pray for those things, that all saints can meet the will of God. Amen. Amen. The worldwide church, people that we've, we've never met and never will meet this side of eternity. Yes. Well, I would 
ask, uh, would one not pray for everybody other than all the Christians? For all of creation? I certainly have. I've, I've, I do. I've, I've prayed for people that I'm certain are not Christians. And he says to pray for our enemies, so. Okay. Okay. Now, walk in wisdom, verse 5 toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each one. We were kind of reflecting on that with that little role playing that, that Matthew and I did. You know, we wanna, we wanna be wise in how we interact with people. Yes? A lot of people in this world are just lonely mm -hmm. and they're lost and they don't feel like people care about them. Right. And, you know, one of the best things is that as people who are creatures of habit, we tend to go to the same places and do the same things most of the time. And, you know, one of the most effective things, like with your story, is not just asking her how her day is, but if you go back to Home Depot mm -hmm. and you see her and you say, I have been praying for you, have things been getting any better? You know, that instantly shows, wow, he actually cares Mm -hmm. And he remembered me. Mm -hmm. It's not just something you said in passing and then never actually no, did. No, we check out. We're going to look for her. Yeah, and that's that's walking in wisdom. That's knowing how to talk to people and how to get a message across that they need to hear. That's right. On your, that's how you redeem the time. Right. Yeah. You're 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 you had one good interaction. You hope and pray for another one at the same place and take whatever action you can to uh, ensure that that, that that happens. Now I've got to figure out something, I need to, something else I need to buy. <laughs> I'll give That's you a list. list. <laughs> You'll need it when Randy goes over and inspects the pellets job. Maybe. Oh yes, I will when he comes over for that. That's yep. right. Okay. All righty. So again, Redeeming the time, walk in wisdom. Let your speech always be seasoned with grace. Whoa, does that define you? Or is your speech seasoned with uh, oh. non-grace? That's eloquent, right? With something that's not gracious. You know, what, how do people describe you? Are you described as a kind person or are you described as something else? Seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each one. We need wisdom for that, right? By the way, did Jesus always, he was the prince of peace and he was kind, meek and lowly. Was he always nice? There were moments when he pointed the bony finger of accusation because it needed to be said and it needed to be said that way. So we need wisdom to know how to express ourselves. Yes, Barry. He went so far as when they were talking about whose father was their father. He, he looked them square in the eye and said, your father is Satan, the devil. Yeah, you're your father, the devil. Uh, he could read their hearts and he knew their minds. So I wouldn't necessarily go around saying that, but <laughs> to, to, the point is, is he did. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the other thing you learn about Jesus is, he never chased after anybody. No. When the uh, the rich young ruler walked away, he didn't go negotiate. No. So yeah, he of course he drove the money changers out of the temple with a whip. Mm -hmm. So, so let your speech always be with grace. Season with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. All right, it is um, 1145 now. The rest of this, I'm going to ask us to read on ourselves because it's mostly goodbyes, except for I do want you to notice in verse 9 with Onesimus a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. Because that'll be somebody that's the next character when we look at the book of Philemon next week. Father in heaven, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. We depend on you. Build us up in you. 
build up our influence in this town, build up our boldness to bear witness of you, and build up our wisdom so that we might know how to do that well. We can't do this without you, because unless you build the house, we labor in vain. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Philemon next week. <laughs>